we have also done problems like these. Let's say we are looking for the support forces F1 and F2. Then we will draw all the forces that are acting on the beam. The beam is light, so we do not have to worry about the mg. And we have mg of this box. And then F1 and F2 acting on the beam will be upward. So F1 goes up and F2 goes up. For net force equals to zero, we know that the upward forces must equal to the downward forces. So we have F1 plus F2 equals to mg. For the net torque equals to zero, we would have to have a fulcrum. There's no fulcrum in this problem, but we can make up one. Because if nothing is moving, it does not matter whether the fulcrum is real or not. For example, we can pretend that there is a fulcrum right here. Because the beam does not rotate anyway, so it does not matter whether this fulcrum is real or not. We can choose to have our pretend fulcrum anywhere we want. The most convenient locations will be either at F1 or F2. Because, for example, if I use F1 as my fulcrum, that means F1 does not give me any torque. So F1 would not show up in our torque equation. So when we write our torque equation, there will be only one unknown F2 in there. That means we'll be able to solve for F2 right away. So we can write our clockwise torque equals to the counterclockwise torque. And in this case, the clockwise torque is produced by mg. So we would have to multiply the mg by the lever arm. That will be the distance between the line of force and the axis. So this is the lever arm for mg. The counterclockwise torque is produced by F2. And the distance between the line of force and the axis is that one this distance. So mg times this lever arm equals to F2 times its lever arm. For this scenario, even though it does not look exactly the same as that one, but if we just look at the forces, they are actually the same because the, the beam has mg at the center of mass. And then the two forces of, of support will go F1 upward and F2 upward. So this problem is just like that one. This diving board problem is trickier. If we draw the force diagram, we would have mg over here, and uh, F2 is a support force that goes uh, upward, but F1 is a support force that goes down, not up. If the direction of the force is not obvious, then what we can do is uh, to keep all the forces there and then pretend that you remove F1. If we pretend that we remove F1, then this end is going to go down and this point is going to go up. That means uh, in order to keep it in place, uh, F1 has to be down. Again, we can pretend that we have a, a fulcrum at any location we want. and the, most convenient locations will be where we have the unknown forces. So either at F1 or at F2, it does not matter which one we use. So let's say, for example, this time I'm choosing to have the fulcrum at F2. Then we have clockwise torque equals to counterclockwise torque. The clockwise torque will be produced by mg force times the lever arm equals to the counterclockwise torque by F1, F1 times its lever arm. So if the length of the diving board is L and the distance between the two supports is X, then the clockwise torque and the counterclockwise torque will be the clockwise torque is mg times the lever arm, which will be L minus X. The counterclockwise torque is produced by F1 and the lever arm is X. Of course, we can also write the net force equals to zero which means the upward force equals to the downward forces. So F2 equals to F1 plus mg. We have also done problems like these. Let's say the beam is light and there's a box M sitting right over here on the beam. We're looking for, say, the tension, the string, and the support force from the wall over here. If we draw the force diagram, we would have mg right here, and the tension in the string pulls on the beam. The force from this support is also going to be slanted. 
is unlike the tension we can see at what angle it slants. But uh, this force we do not know at what angle it slants. So it would be more convenient for us to separate the force into a horizontal component and a vertical component. The horizontal component goes that way because it will have to cancel with uh, the horizontal component from the tension. So let's just call that one F sub X. And then the Y component of the force from here, it goes upward. And I'm just going to call it F sub Y. The slanted tension has two components. The horizontal component is adjacent to the angle. So this one is T cosine theta. And that one, of course, will be T sine theta. So when we write the force equation for the x direction, the force to the right and the force to the left, they must be equal. So fx equals to t cosine theta. In the y direction, up and the down, they are equal. So the y component of f plus the t sine theta would have to equal to mg. And then we have to write the torque equation, the clockwise torque equals to the counterclockwise torque. That means that we need a fulcrum. The most convenient location for a fulcrum is over here because we have two unknown forces, Fx and Fy over here. If this is our fulcrum, then neither of those two forces will give us uh, torque. So they will not show up in our equation. In this case, uh, the mg will give us clockwise torque and tension will give us counterclockwise torque. So the clockwise torque is the force mg times its, le times its uh, lever arm, which is uh, x which equals to the counterclockwise torque tension times its lever arm. But since we have components already, we can also look at the components. T cosine theta goes through the fulcrum. So the horizontal component does not give us any torque. The perpendicular component T sine theta is the one that gives us torque. And what is the lever arm for T sine theta? It is uh, L. So now we have three equations to solve for our three unknowns.